everyone and welcome to our second to last session for the day, but definitely by no means least. Um, we have a panel around redesigning and redefining diagnostics with AI and data. Please do put any questions you have into the chat and question function. We will do our best to answer them. Um, if not, I'm sure the speakers will be more than happy to ask them individually after the session. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to the moderator for today's session to uh, introduce the panelists in more detail. Um, Adam Dakin, the Managing Director for Dream It Ventures. So Adam, over to you. All right. Thanks, Becky. Uh, uh... Big thanks to the organizers, all the all the great folks at LSX for uh, inviting me to moderate this panel. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. We had a, a great pregame discussion beforehand, a really terrific group of panelists, lots of terrific insights came out of that conversation, which, uh, which we're gonna share with you today. And I think you'll find there's some real actionable uh, insights you're gonna get from, from this conversation. Uh, so before we jump in it, we got a lot to cover. Uh, so we may talk fast, I tend to talk fast anyway. Uh, and I'm gonna try to keep the panel moving because we've got a lot of topics to get through. Um, so uh, before we get started here, I'll ask each of the panelists to give themselves, uh, give a quick intro of themselves and we'll start with Wim and then we'll go around the horn here. Thank you so much, Adam, and really great to being part of this panel uh, at LSX. So I'm Wim van Hecke, I'm the founder and CEO of Icometrics. Um, and Icometrics's aim is to help people with neurological disorders uh, by making the brain measurable so we are very brain focused, um, though we did develop a chest CT solution for COVID-19 last year to help in the pandemic. Um, but brain is our thing and in brain, uh, brain scans, uh, MRI or CT scans are crucial uh, for diagnosis and monitoring. Uh, but unfortunately, the outcome of the scan is a radiological report, which is still mostly qualitative and descriptive and based on a, on a visual assessment. So we developed AI tools that assist radiologists by extracting clinically relevant information from these scans. Um, in addition, these tools can quantify brain damage and changes over time. Um, and they are CE marked, FDA cleared uh, for multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, epilepsy, stroke, and traumatic brain injury. Um, and so we work with providers, hospital systems that use our solutions to improve workflow and patient care, but also with pharma companies uh, for Great. drug development and real world evidence studies. Awesome, thanks Wim. Liam? Hi, I'm Liam Kaufman, the uh, co-founder and CEO of Winterlight Labs. Uh, we make uh, speech-based digital biomarkers for measuring neurological and psychiatric illness. So some concrete examples, uh, when someone has schizophrenia, they tend to be more incoherent with their speech so we can measure that inco incoherence mathematically. Uh, when people have Alzheimer's disease, they have word finding deficits. Uh, we can measure that because they have longer pauses between words. They have trouble thinking of the right words, so they use fewer nouns and more pronouns like he, she, it, etc. cetera. Uh, people who are depressed tend to uh, speak slower. So we can objectively pick up on all these different markers across these different conditions. Uh, and right now we're working with um, about a dozen pharmaceutical companies, uh, five of the top 10. Their interest is coming up with more objective ways of measuring response to therapy and uh, more recently doing so remotely. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks, Liam. Thomas? I'm Thomas Hummel. Um, I'm leading strategy and innovation for Siemens Healthineers uh, Digital Health. Um, and uh, while we are part of our diagnostic imaging division, we have a mandate for the entire company. Siemens Healthineers, as you may know, is a, a big med tech company. Uh, we are mostly in uh, diagnostics. We are in uh, image diagnostics, CTs, MRs, ultrasound devices. We are as well in lab diagnostic uh, and uh, we have a therapy arm, which uh, already um, was uh, relatively big and uh, now through the acquisition of Varian became even bigger. And obviously like every big company, we are very much into digitalization as well um, in the different areas that we do as a business. And then the idea is really to support and automate uh, the clinical decisions along the entire patient pathway end to end uh, to drive quality, to drive um, um, efficiency and standardization. And uh, that's uh, really the thing we are doing. And very nice to be here with you. Great. John? Hi, good afternoon. I'm John Bertrand. I'm the CEO of Digital Diagnostics. Uh, we are an AI platform that takes specialty sensors, uh, inserts fully autonomous AI that's FDA cleared and authorized, that then allows us to take those sensors and move them into broader access points for the patients. So think primary care, retail health, uh, diagnostic chains. Our first uh, cleared fully autonomous AI was for the diabetic eye exam, allowing us to remove physician oversight 
and allowing those physicians to practice top of license. So rather than spending a third of their time on screens, they spend 100% of their time on interventions. Awesome. Great. Uh, and again, Becky was kind enough to introduce me, Adam Dakin, Managing Director of Dream Ventures. We are a Philadelphia-based venture fund. We focus on digital health and medical devices. Uh, what's unique about us is we run what you could loosely call an accelerator. We prefer to call it a growth platform. We work with the best of the best digital health and med tech companies uh, and help them accelerate access to customers through our our stakeholder network of payers, providers, large multinationals, as well as uh, helping them accelerate access to capital through our syndicate network of over a thousand venture funds that, that we work with. And, uh, and we're one of the most active investors uh, in seed and series A uh, investments in, in the health tech space. All right, so with that, uh, let's jump into it. Um, lots to cover here. We're gonna try to cover kind of where we are in terms of adoption. We're gonna talk about the challenges and headwinds impact and adoption. And hopefully with a little bit of time, we're going to talk about the future direction um, and where the market is going. Uh, to set a little bit of context, right, every diagnostic, every new diagnostic, every new innovation has to go through a certain process. There's the development phase of validating the technology. You know, does it actually work? Is it sensitive? Is it specific? Um, you know, and so there's a process to go through there. And then once that process is completed, then we move into more product market fit and commercialization, borrowing from Jeffrey Moore's crossing the chasm, right? We have the early adopters in the market, uh, the forward thinkers who are kind of willing to try things before they've been fully kind of validated or the use cases have been fully vetted or proven. Uh, and then we cross that chasm to widespread adoption over to standard of care. So in that journey, I'm curious as to where all the panelists think we are, or ask the question another way, are we there yet? Uh, let's start with Thomas, because I think Thomas, you can maybe set, set some context in terms of where does a large multinational see, uh, you know, the market evolution right now, use cases, uh, and, where, and, and what's got Siemens excited? Right. Well, you know, as, as I said, we have a relatively big portfolio and uh, we are working actually a lot in the um, um, idea of uh, precision medicine, precision diagnostics. We want to actually support our customers, our HCPs that typically buy our equipment um, with um, different AI solutions. And uh, one of the most pertinent things here, obviously being a radiology company, adding these CTs, MRs is one of our big things, is uh, image-based uh, AI. So, you know, you want to actually have uh, an image coming out of a modality, out of a CT or so, run that through an algorithm and actually get a, a read on, uh, for example, lesions that you have in there. You want to have a volumetric measuring and so on. So you want to really get uh, insights. You want to get clinical decision support about what you see there. Now, in terms of where we are, I think um, the um, AI market in, in medical imaging is still in early stage. Uh, so we are still all going out in the market. We are still deploying these things. It all works. So that, that uh, test has been passed. But we're now in the point where we are, need to go into the mainstream market. And that's really like the interesting thing. Um, moving from the first few phases, we have uh, shown the technology, it works very well, and you know, we can really do these things. We have a clear idea of what it does in our environment, in the HCP environment, what it helps them, how it helps them with quality, how it helps them with uh, efficiencies. But now um, what I think the three big drivers are, one is uh, clinical breadth and depth. It doesn't help the radiologist yet as if he has one algorithm and not anything else. So you need to go in the breadth of the different uh, um, diagnostics and the, the different um, uh, indications. The second is obviously in the product and algorithm quality. Uh, and that comes then with the third part, routine capability and workflow integration. You need to get into the clinical routine and the day-to-day -day capabilities. Otherwise, it doesn't really make sense. You need to change, obviously, processes. So there's a lot of things to be done. But we are at that point. I think we are like crossing that chasm, as you called it quite nicely, where we're going to mainstream now. Uh, and that's uh, looking very good. Um, there's still a lot to learn, a lot to find out, specifically as we move into the mainstream market. But I think it looks, in general, quite good. So are you seeing, uh, you know, succinct answer, just a quick question here, so I want to keep things moving, but you said we're early in the journey. So early in the journey, does that mean you are seeing platforms today that you think, you know, let's say we're under the Siemens umbrella, would be ready for widespread commercialization, they just haven't been adopted yet, or there's still further market validation, uh, you know, to, to be vetted here before that adoption happens? I would say they are ready, not just us, but uh, others as well. And then Wim can speak to that. I think we are all at a point where we are 
uh, absolutely confident that this is a reliable and good and working technology and, and uh, is something which we can definitely bring out in the market. It really is just that the widespread adoption is, is uh, something that is now coming up and there's again all the questions about how to get that into a routine, into the clinical routine. We work with a lot of collaboration partners and I'm sure a lot of the other companies do that as well because uh, it's easy to sit down and to make a fantastic solution in your ivory tower and come out with that and then have nothing that would really play a role in a, in a clinical routine. So we work actually with the collaboration partners and the feedback there is very good. But again, you change processes, you know, you have like a, a lot of things, a reimbursement is for example, a question. So you have a lot of points that now on the move to really scaling it up, we have to address and we have to find solutions to it. Technology, I think is proven. Technology, I think it works. Technology is something that we really have well under control, all the, the different companies that are in the market. So I think we are well, beyond this early have to prove its status. We are now more moving into like, this is now how we go into the market and make it a scalable business for us. Got it. Okay. Well, nice segue over to Wim. Um, Wim, do you wanna, you wanna chime in on this? Yeah, I can mainly uh, agree with what Thomas said. I think uh, on the imaging side, uh, the last few decades were mainly about um, um, revolutionizing the scanners, getting better quality data in a faster way and with higher resolutions. And uh, as Thomas said, it's now all about transforming these scans with a wealth of information in it in something that is quantifiable, that gets, gets numbers out of it to, to help later on in the clinical pathway. I agree that it, it's on the brink of, of like really um, wide adoption and going towards standard of care. Um, I think if you speak with radiologists, um, they, they know that it's gonna be standard of care and that in a few years, we don't know how long uh, people might look back and say, oh, we just looked at images and we didn't use really quantified information to make a decision. Um, so I think the, the workflow is there, um, the, the quality is there. Um, it, it, it's demonstrated, it can provide clinical insights. Uh, so it's all about adoption indeed. Um, and, and also as, as Thomas alluded to, I think, um, I mean, imaging is, is especially for neurological disorders the, where we are focused on, uh, it's an important piece, but it's only one piece of a complex puzzle towards precision medicine. And um, okay. I think we're a bit further away there in terms of uh, um, yeah, validating these things and the whole pathways of having impact on patient outcomes, um, right. but that's definitely changing fast. Okay, Liam? Yeah, I can, I can share some uh, personal um, anecdotes. So in you know, 2016, 2017, when we started to talk to uh, pharmaceutical companies, um, they spoke with us as we were sort of like an intellectual curiosity. You know, what you guys are doing are really, you know, neat, cool, um, but, but, but that was sort of it. And then in 2017, plus or minus, um, basically every pharmaceutical company created a digital health, digital biomarker group. Right. Um, and then so by 2018, early 2019, the, the follow-up was, okay, so we're trying to develop a strategy. Let's do something small. Um, and, and then 2019 and 2020, that kind of exploded because all these sort of small projects turned into big projects and big initiative. Um, and, and so you can kind of see uh, this crossing of the chasm almost like in, 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 in real time. Um, with, with these common conversations uh, unfolding and, and, and the change in, in credibility too has, has, has been massive. Um, and then outside of pharma, what we've seen again is, is sort of like a similar trend where, where companies you know, are kind of scratching their head, they're not quite sure. And now like, well, this is exactly how we wanna use these, these digital biomarkers. And it's, it's sort of uh, night and day different um, in, in the past 12 months. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited where things are heading. Right, John? Um, largely agree uh, that we're at the point where we're kind of just exiting the early adopters, uh, but I do think it's a little um, specialty or modality specific. Radiology, I think, is a little bit further behind than, say, where we experience things in the eye care space, uh, where we have broad support from societies. Uh, they're some of our biggest advocates. We have reimbursement set up, uh, where if you look at what you see out of ACR recently, there's still mixed messages and how ready the early majority is to adopt. Uh, but in general, you know, we're hanging out in the chasm right now, figuring out which individual kind of tools are gonna land into the early majority and stick. Uh, but I definitely think per Liam's comment, there's enough uh, energy that's been spent the last few years to get people on board with the fact that this is going to, going to be coming into healthcare from a tech perspective. It's just which individual indications and applications are gonna really resonate with the uh, early majority. Great. 
So we're going to talk about challenges and headwinds in a moment, but I'm going to push back on you guys a little bit and I want you to spar with me. Okay. I'm put, I've got my investor hat on and I don't agree with you. I think we're much earlier than you guys say, and I'll tell you why. I mean, yes, on the diagnostic side, sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, seems like we've gotten over that, that hurdle. But as you guys know better than I do, right? The challenge for any diagnostic isn't just the accuracy of the data, it's the proven impact on the actual outcomes and it's the ROI. I mean, we just did a survey, Dream It, in collaboration with MedCity. We just did a survey of innovation leaders at 20 healthcare systems and asked them what changed post pandemic. And almost universally, they said there's this renewed hyper focus on ROIs. They're not gonna pay for anything if you can't prove the ROI. And the way most of these platforms get to prove an ROI, right, is some way of reducing utilization, improving an outcome, making a workflow more efficient. It's gotta be one of those. So my question back to all of you is, have you proven the ROIs? Have you proven the, have these platforms generally, and you could talk about yours specifically, if it makes sense, but are we really there yet? Because I don't think most of the platforms we've seen as a fund have really proven they can move the outcomes needle. I would agree with you on that. I think there's a very narrow set with documented and validated outcomes. And there's a whole lot of tools that I see uh, that are just trying to allow a physician to move faster and build more physician CPT codes, which is essentially creating more of the problem that supposedly this automation is trying to solve. So I think you have to be very careful as you're looking at any of these solutions, especially in the investor's chair, to make sure you're actually uh, returning value to the overall system as well as the patient, while at the same time not becoming a burden for the physician as other recent technologies have been for them when they were pushed out into the market or, or mandated. You know, I'd, I'd agree. I completely agree with you too. <clears throat> it really is that question about uh, you know getting reimbursement is a certainly a very important point. I think it's generally even clearly you, know, you can make the point where the value is uh, the value in terms of efficiency, the term in terms of like a, you know quality, in terms of uh, you have the, the first year you know, uh, resident sitting there on the weekend and at night, and, and you just want them to to somehow not make a mistake, and you want to support them with these tools. So that's all. That's a, a story that's credible, but still. The prices that you can get for that, uh, and, and I can very much relate to what you said. It's either you have some sort of an efficiency out of a process, you have you have to prove something that really makes sense. Otherwise, you wouldn't get a lot of money. Now, not, none of the radiologists is going to pay you hundreds of euros for a read. It's going to be like a few euros, a few dollars. And um, you know, if you think about some of the competitors in that space, they have like a one dollar read. So from that, you can't really live. If you think about what you have to do in there in the background to build all these algorithms and buy data to learn and so on. There's a, a lot of money at stake. So that definitely is an interesting question. For us, I would say at Siemens, um, it's certainly said that we want to make money with the whole thing. We want to obviously at least break it even, that's completely clear uh, and make more of it. But we as a maker of radiology equipment, we could not live without having such a thing. You know, we could not let that space to others because that's obviously a tech angle where we would possibly have the whole IT companies come into our area and suck the value out of the machines. And that's definitely what we don't want to have. So for us, it certainly is as well um, making sure that we control a very important place in the whole area and then are in face to face with radiologists. We have to make a point of radiology next month. Yeah, if I can add to that, I, I think I agree with the comments that were made. I mean, there's different ways of an R measuring R ROI uh, in terms of indeed quality and workflow. And But in the end, it's all about outcomes of patients. And uh, to my earlier point, I think that's um, has been shown to some extent, but still needs some work um, that it really changes outcome and changes uh, therapeutic decisions and so on. I think there's already, again, looking at, at our space, a lot of work done. And I think uh, we're very close to having an impact on that. Um, uh, but that's a difference in, in thinking about silos like radiology and imaging versus uh, surgery versus uh, neurologist. I mean, the, val the real value of tools like, like, uh, like ours and, and the other companies is really in that chain and, and the care pathway where you have an impact. Um, so that's just a different way of, of, uh, of thinking in medicine in general, I think. Did you wanna to add to that, Liam? Yeah, yeah, just to add to that, there, there's this sort of catch-22 where if if we try to do work with a provider, they want to see the evidence that, that, that you're talking about, um, but we can't get that evidence, you know, without working with a, a large provider. 
Um, and so one of the things that I, I think is worth pointing out is that it doesn't necessarily have to be binary, like either you have it or you don't have it. But in some cases, as a startup and early stage company, you look for incremental wins. Um, and so an example, like when you work with pharma companies, we're not a primary endpoint in a clinical trial. So we're an experimental endpoint. They aren't using our endpoint for their you know, primary decision making. That, that's the primary endpoint. But what, what they need as a pharmaceutical company is additional information to support the primary. Um, and so we're part of sort of like a basket of evidence that supports the primary. So when that they go to the FDA or they go to payers, they say, look, it's not just the primary that is significant. It's also all this other information um, that happens to be significant, whether it's speech biomarkers or, or other things. And so I think a part of the way that companies can go about this is, is by uh, incrementally getting closer to that goal of being able to like prove, you know, that, that they can improve ROI. Got it. So I want to switch gears a little bit. And so we talk about crossing that chasm and the friction points in getting across that chasm. Um, and so before the panel, we talked a little bit about some of those friction points, which include things like we've touched on most of them already, reimbursement, changing workflows, um, you know, budget constraints, EHR integration, right? The bane of, of, of every company that has to share data with a healthcare system. Uh, my partners, I, we always jokingly call the IT department, the wood chipper of digital health, right? It's where great startups go to die. Um, I always say that, you know, that long line down the hallway, that's the line in front of the IT department, you know, get on the end of it and wait for your turn in six months. Um, so those are all areas that create challenges, right? For every startup or early stage company trying to get into the market. Reimbursement is clearly one of the 800 pound gorillas uh, there. And so I, I'd love to hear all of your insights on, you know, what you're, you guys are out there, the startups here, you guys are in the trenches fighting the gorilla war every day. What are the greatest points of friction that you face as you try to drive this towards wide scale adoption? I'm happy to go like first. It. Yeah, go ahead, John. Uh, I think, uh... I hear you on all the points. I think the lack of clarity on business model is really the biggest issue because that's what throttles you from additional investment or whether that's new capital coming into your business and convincing new investors to come on board or convincing your board to let you place bets on, on new innovation. Um, there are different companies having success with different models. There's been movement um, recently, we're the, we were the first company to receive reimbursement from the U.S. government through CMS and a new CPT code. But that's one example. Lots of other people are still trying to figure that out. Um, yeah, you can do subscriptions, but then you have to go, that goes back to the previous conversation on proving you have evidence to back that up. Um, so I think that's, to me, the largest one. Changing workflows is hard. IT integration is hard. I used to be an exec at an EMR vendor. I get it. Um, but for me right now, what I see as far as what's throttling us from more uh, innovation in space is a clear pathway to payment. Yeah, I completely Lynn, you agree with that. that. Yeah. I was going to say uh, it's it's definitely the business model in in digital health and and, and AI. It's it's often not the tech that's the barrier. It's really determining how to make this sustainable. Um, and if you're a startup too, if you're doing an enterprise deal. Uh, and you're you know, first to market, it may take 24 months to go from first meeting to signing an agreement. And if you have 18 months of runway, that's uh, uh, pretty tough to uh, uh, manage. So you have to be pretty patient um, and, and have that expectation that things are gonna take a while for your first you know, deal or two. When? Not being a startup. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Thomas. Not being a startup, uh, but uh, one of the issues that we have, and it's like, you know, I completely agree with uh, uh, what was said so far, but uh, one of the issues that we have is uh, we want to obviously scale our activities globally. We want to scale them relatively quickly because that obviously makes it then interesting that uh, you know, uh, pays for all the investment into training and so on, the, the uh, algorithm and so on. But obviously going global means you go to all different health systems. And even in Europe, yes, we have the European Union, but if you go to France and to Germany and to Switzerland and to whatever Austria, so you have three, four different, completely different healthcare systems with different uh, arrangements in terms of reimbursement, in terms of what works, what doesn't work. And it's, that's, that's adding an additional pain on top of the whole thing. But uh, it's, if you have reimbursement in the US, that's a big market. If you go to Europe, you have a lot of small markets and it's much more difficult than to really scale the whole thing to get in the market. 
Yeah, I'm not sure the U.S. is that is necessarily that much different because it's so fragmented, right? I mean, you've got 50 states, you know, 50 uh, different decision makers, government, you know, that decides what they want to reimburse. You got CMS, you got the private payers within the private payers, you've got multiple different private payers, right? That's real guerrilla warfare, right? Trying to get sort of one by one, you know, universal coverage has been the bane of, of many startups existence, right? Because it could take years and years to get that sort of universal coverage across, you know, the entire spectrum of payers. Um, Wim, what, what, do you, what, what have been the big friction points you've faced? I think I, I can agree with most of what has been said. Uh, and, and also, uh, as mentioned, on the one hand, we're facing uh, especially a reimbursement system, which is pretty much in silos and different specialities. At the other hand, for example, on imaging, it's mainly around technical fees, like you do a scan and you get a certain uh, reimbursement for it, but you're not reimbursed for the quality of the scan or for the care that you give the patient or the outcome uh, of that. Um, so so that, that's indeed some things that we are facing. So in, the, in that sense, you, I mean, we do work with a lot of hospitals, but the money should come from another bucket somewhere. Um, and in addition, I think too, on, on, and, and especially in the future, as more and more of that digital technology will, will indeed start crossing that chasm, I think there will be a lot of need for more education uh, in the curriculum of, of, of medical doctors. Um, I think it's starting to, to be there, but in the end, um, medical doctors will have a whole different profession where they have access to a lot of tools to make decisions, but they need to know what they can do and what they can't do, uh, because in the end, they'll be sitting in the driver's seat to, to make these difficult decisions. So I see there, especially going further also, um, yeah, an important role of education. Yeah, that's a good point. I think you're right. There is a distinction, at least my sense is that kind of the older generation of clinicians still, there's a high level of mistrust um, of AI. You know, it's, it's sort of like, you know, the younger generation grew up, you know, with video games. Uh, and in virtual worlds and the older generation did not. And I think a lot of the older doctors sort of feel like that's more of a threat. Like you're trying to replace me. And I think maybe the younger doctors get, no, you're actually just trying to make me better. Um, but that's probably gonna take a while for the market to, you know, for that next generation of doctors. And, and the, because the older generation generally tend to be the ones with the power, right? They're the authority, they're the chiefs of the departments. They're the ones that, that can be the blockers and they have the veto power, you know, regardless of how enthusiastic kind of the younger generation of, of providers may be. Yeah, it would be interesting too to, to hear John's thoughts on, I mean, being an autonomous AI company, um, kind of doing, replacing doctors with some tasks. Uh, if you see differences there in terms of assisting versus replacing and, and in terms of adoption and, and, and barriers. We never talk about it as replacing the physician. What we're actually doing is allowing the provider to practice top of license. We're taking the lowest skill, narrowest task, uh, most obnoxious task off their schedule and moving it to a high school educated operator that presses go in the machine and the autonomous AI that's been FDA validated and has uh, continuous efficacy monitoring to track its performance. That's just taking care of all that for you. Uh, instead, what you'll be able to do is practice top of license and only do the interventions, the exciting stuff, the reason you became a physician. Mm -hmm. you know, in, in my mind, if we're doing it right, AI should elevate the physician more into like a health coach or a wellness uh, coordinator for you, rather than someone that's just coming in and running a battery of tests and all their energy is focused on executing those. So it's helping people understand that. Um, I think depending on the specialty you're in that, that's received differently, I've done a lot of work in the radi uh, radiology space. That's the core of radiologist's job. So that's a little bit different of a conversation. Whereas we go to eye care, we go to dermatology, we go to cardiology, a lot of those batteries of tests, they don't wanna be doing anyway. So we're really kind of selling cold glasses of ice water and hell to an extent. So again, it kind of, it goes back to some of the comments made earlier of, it depends what indication you're going after and what specialty you're playing. Yep, makes, makes perfect sense. I knew I could just, I could just see John having an allergic reaction when Wim said, well, you're replacing doctors, right? Um, and look, we see a lot of startups. And I think, you know, I think everyone has figured out now that no matter how uh, efficient, how much of efficiency improvement your platform delivers, you know, the words that shall not be spoken are firing or getting rid of staff, right? Because you're, you know, you've immediately created a constituency, you know, uh, of enemies, the second you start saying words like you can get rid of staff. 
Um, so I know at least our startups are, you know, have, have positioned that differently and saying, well, top, just like John said, top of license, or you can repurpose that staff to higher value tasks, which is true, right? But even the hint that you're replacing somebody uh, is probably not going to go, it, that conversation is generally not going to go well uh, when it gets to those mm -hmm. folks. Um, here's a question. Well, you know, uh, it's, it's, yeah, not even just, it's not just even the, there's, it's not just even the radiologist. So we had a funny discussion because obviously we bring our solution as a, as a service. So, you know, you have the data goes into our system and then actually the processing is done and back comes a result. Uh, and that means it's an as a service solution, which we thought was a quite nice idea because the HCP can focus on what he really wants. He wants a result, he wants an exam, he wants, he wants the insight, he wants the decision to be made. He doesn't want to own a stack of software and hardware and have IT people and so on. But in the hospitals, there is obviously an IT department. So when we come in and say like, well, we bring this as a service to you, you have a lot of people which are not necessarily so happy. Uh, and you have that uh, discussion as well, how you actually bring such an algorithm to the hospital. Just a bit of a side note, but it's, it's an interesting discussion that we have there as well. Uh, given how hard it is to get widespread reimbursement for any new diagnostic, um, does it make sense to even fight that battle? Or is it, is it make more sense just to try to go with the value-based world, go to integrated systems where they are the payer and the provider, and if you have an outcome story that's compelling, right, and ultimately saves on the overall cost of care of the patients, um, you know, maybe just as a go-to-market strategy, you know, focus on those integrated delivery systems as opposed to trying to fight the guerrilla warfare, you know, of getting you know, individual, as, as Wim said, all these siloed payers out there um, to sign on. I mean, I'm curious, as, I guess I'm asking, what in, what, how do you view the reimbursement approach? What's your strategy there to the yeah. startups? I think from our side, if I can, I can answer that, it's, it's, it's it, I mean, of course, the big uh, goal is to, to get a final CPT code and reimbursement. And, and, but there's a lot of steps in between, as you said, with IDMs and providing value and return on investment. Uh, at different levels. So, uh, and I think um, what most of the scale ups do, they we like to work iteratively. And, and so we, we get in the market, we, um, we get, yeah, we are paid for what we do, not on the largest scale as we wanting uh, it to be. And it could be potentially, but then you get market insights, you develop clinical outcomes and, and, and results on that. And in the meantime, you work on the bigger goal. And I think also to, to, to Liam's uh, uh, part. I mean, uh, we also work with pharmaceutical companies, which is another way to, um, yeah, improve value of your tools um, and and develop um, um, out, uh, relate them to outcomes and things like that, uh, which is another way to grow a uh, business. But in the meantime, go to that end goal. Gotcha. So, Liam, quick. I mean, short answer. Are you are you out there? Do you anticipate fighting the guerrilla warfare, hand to hand combat of converting individual payers to to fund your 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 platform, your diagnostic? Not directly, uh, at least at least in the short term. So we work through pharmaceutical companies, but increasingly we're doing uh, deals with other digital health companies uh, publicly, like we did a deal with Paratherapeutics. And so uh, there's a lot of companies that want to integrate our digital biomarkers into their platform. So we can sort of save the work for them to do that. Um, and then we can you know, keep focus on our expertise, which is speech and language and, and diagnostics. Got it. John, sounds like you are going to, you, you already did fight the battle, it sounds like. Oh, it's ongoing. Um, to, to your point about the U.S. being fragmented and more information for Thomas, you get CMS coverage and you have to go talk to 12 MACs, which the regional uh, decision makers for the rate set. Uh, not to mention, if you go into a single market, you're going to have at least a dozen commercial pairs to talk to, to, to close out the rest of it. So we are going that pathway. Um, largely because we are we are automating a test that already exists. There's a use case, there's outcomes data. All I'm doing is removing the physician from it. And it's widely accepted that all I'm doing is making a known outcome cheaper and more accessible for people. If I were trying to go down a new pathway and producing a new outcome uh, that's not been documented before, then I, I would probably lean more towards finding other, other reimbursement pathways or, or payment pathways. I would say though, Adam, to your original point about integrated networks, Across the U.S., there's roughly 10 of them. Uh, Kaiser is one of them and makes up about 80% of the market. So unless you've gotten Kaiser to get really excited about what you're doing, that pathway only goes so far. And I think that's why you see so many AI companies chasing the, the life science, uh, bio, pharma type of dollar because they have big checkbooks. They're willing to uh, spend money on the new innovation. 
I worry in the long run, like how is that distorting where we bring the innovation? We're focusing so much in one side of the market rather than on the delivery side, because that's harder, longer pathway and, and frankly, more risky. Yeah, it's a great point. Um, yeah, I think a lot of startups don't realize to you that there really are only 10 IDMs, uh, IDNs. And, but sort of skating to where the puck is going to be, you know, five years from now, presumably there's going to be a lot more, right? Because a lot of health systems are going to add health plans uh, to the system as they sort of get comfortable with taking on that risk and, and understanding what that means. Okay, uh, a good question from the audience, I think. Um, and I'm going to just paraphrase a little bit here. Um, and, and maybe add some of my own color to it. So not sure if, if you guys have heard uh, Dr. Steve Clasco, who's the president and CEO of Jefferson talk on sort of where the world is going and, and they've got a very unique approach to delivery. And he's talked uh, about AI. And uh, Dr. Clasco has said that in the future, the doctor's role will change dramatically because the AI will be able to just completely diagnose and effectively treat the patient. The doctor's role will switch to one that's more of context. Um, for example, hey, uh, hey, John, I understand that your daughter is getting married in a month. So let's think about whether or not we want to put you on the chemotherapy right now, right? And let's titrate or adjust therapy to your specific situation in life, right? Um, I think it's an interesting observation. The question from the audience, which, is, which relates to this is, at the primary care level, do, you, do, do all of you think the role of the primary care doctor is going to change once they've been sort of enabled or empowered with uh, the, the powerful diagnostic tools um, that, that we can give them through AI? I guess, hasn't it started already to do that? I mean, with the medical home, move to value-based care, ACOs, a lot of policy has been behind shifting things that way. And it the tech is starting, depending on where you feel like it's at crossing the chasm, to move in the direction of empowering them to do that. So I feel like you've got a lot of tailwinds there. So I, I would I would say yes, because of those two different factors, the tech and the regulator. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, the way we, to, to pick up an earlier point that we had, the way we uh, discussed with the uh, HCPs is that we don't want to automate in a way. We want to automate all the tedious tasks that they don't want to do either. You know, that they really are happy. The machine can take them over and then let, uh, let them really focus on what they really want to do and then bring in, if it is the context that's completely fine, I think there's much more to it than just the context. But I do agree that it changes very much and it changes probably much to the better. Uh, and that's not the only technology. There's other technologies like, you know, if you think about nuance, that uh, the whole idea of having that speech technology that it doesn't have to write up anymore. It can actually look into your eyes and can speak with you. I think there's a lot in the way and I completely agree with John that's already ongoing, that's already a reality. The question is how far that goes, but I do agree and I do hope that this happens really because that really will make a qualitative change that is really meaningful and necessary. Yeah, I, I agree as well. I think the primary care physician plays such an important role. Um, I think uh, giving the right tools at hand, it, it will really improve the whole care pathway. Patients will be referred faster to the right doctors. Um, and, and be in the right care pathway immediately. Like for example, in detecting early Alzheimer's disease, which, which will become more and more important for yeah, the available therapies to work. Um, these patients typically will, yeah, will be first at a primary care physician. And if they're the right um, uh, biomarkers can be picked up and, and, and displayed, I think having them in the right system and seeing the right doctor faster will have a huge impact. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, I'll right, the primary care, the referral is typically to an expert, right, to a specialist who is the expert. So if you can bring that expertise down to the level of the primary care doctor, potentially you can avoid the cost of, you know, of these, of these referrals. Um, I think that model is yet to be proven in terms of real data that shows we can reduce those, those referral rates. We certainly look at a lot of platforms that look to make that referral process more, more efficient. I don't know that it's actually it's actually been, been sort of proven yet. Um, but I think it is you know, where that is all going. Of course, um, when we look at platforms for primary care, the first thing we just jumps off the page at is we've, we've seen a lot of awesome platforms that are clearly you know, going to, to change that pattern or make the care more efficient and accurate. But workflow is everything for a primary care physician, right? I mean, they've got 10 minutes to see a patient. They're already overburdened. They're working 12 hour days. They're spending two to three hours at the end of the day, just catching up on paperwork. 
So if you add five minutes to their day, they're just not going to use it. Mm. Uh, and I'm always surprised how many startups come in and they go, yeah, you know, Dr. Smith just has to do this. And all he's got to do is go to this other portal over here. Um, you know, and, but we're going to make this so much better. I'm like, are you kidding me? Trust me, Dr. Smith is not going to click and bring up a new portal. I know you say it takes one or two minutes. Dr. Smith doesn't, can't spend an extra one or two minutes for each patient he uses your platform for. Um, I, I see you nodding your head a little bit there, John. Is this, uh, yeah, did you want to add to that point? I've seen this back in the EMR days, asking anyone to make another click and the revolts that, that soon ensued. Um, we saw that in our initial go to market where it was like, oh yeah, we're just gonna ask people to spend 10 more minutes on a diagnostic test uh, that otherwise they could just kick down, down, the, down the hallway to the specialist. Um, there's a lot you need to do from a product perspective to make sure you can shift that burden to somebody else that's support staff, that's one alternative. Uh, the other is finding areas, patients traffic uh, that complement primary care. You know, for example, we see tons of customers and recommend put this in your lab draw station. Patients already getting an A1C done. You can run the diagnostic test there. There's a ton of downtime in a lab draw station for that lab tech, and the primary care doesn't have to doc doesn't have to do anything different in their workflow. They just click sign on the order that's automatically popped up by the EMR. So you have to be really careful with workflow. Completely agree. Uh, when you're going to primary care. Uh, you made me laugh so hard. I've seen so many people promote to me one more portal, one more place to go. Yeah, they're not going to do that unless it's printing a thousand dollars a click. It's just not worth their time. And, and that's totally understandable. Yep. Yeah, I think it's it's a, it's a blind spot for many startups who are sort of enamored with their technology, but haven't put themselves in the shoes of the customer um, and really seen what their what their workflow is like. OK, we don't have a lot of time yet left. So I want to do I do want to shift gears and talk about the future direction of the market. Where are things going? from here. And, and so when I look back at the evolution of sort of remote patient monitoring platforms, to use a little bit of an analogy here, right? We started out three, four, five years ago, uh, they were very siloed. So you had a platform for hypertension, you had one for congestive heart failure, you had one for asthma, right? We had all these different platforms and providers were being sold Though we've got, you know, we got the best CHF platform, you should work with us. Um, the market has clearly evolved away from that. That's what we, we call point solutions now. And, and you talk to the chief medical officer of a healthcare system and they do not want point solutions, right? They, they don't wanna deal with five different vendors for five different platforms. They want one vendor, one invoice, one point of support, one integration into their EHR. Right? And so we're seeing already seeing that consolidation with companies like Livongo starting to gobble up these, these smaller point solutions so they can create what you might truly call a platform. Uh, are we going, are, are we, is that gonna happen in diagnostics? Is it already happening in diagnostics or are we still at that earlier phase where, hey, it's so hard to develop just a single use case solution that that's where we are now. And then ultimately will these succeed as, as standalone solutions or will we see that sort of same consolidation that we've seen on remote patient monitoring platforms? I think we'll, we'll absolutely see consolidation. Uh, I mean, human behavior is incredibly complicated and, and it'd be naive to assume that only speech can capture all the variation. Um, and, and, and where we're hearing sponsors and pharma companies is they want to look at speech, they want to look at activity patterns, they want to look at genetics, eye movements, facial expressions. And so to do that, you have to start combining all these different biomarkers onto a single platform. They don't want participants to have to download four different apps to collect all this data. They just want a single app um, and so I, I absolutely agree. You're going to see a lot of consolidation over the next few years. I, yeah, I agree. Sorry, Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I agree with Liam's comment on, on the rationale as to why. I think there's other factors to consider too. One is pure economics. Uh, why would each one of these point solutions build duplicative infrastructures that cost a lot of money, uh, have their own different sales channels? I think we're going to see the platform consolidation on themes around either different disease states or needs or different uh, distribution channel call points where there's efficiencies. It mirrors, just like you said, with patient monitoring. Uh, before that, the EMR uh, environment went through it too. It's a pretty consistent pattern you see healthcare follow. Sorry, Thomas. Okay. Yep. Thomas, a, a quick comment. We, we've got to wrap up, but anything you want to add in the last 10 seconds or so? No, John, John just said it. <laughs> oh, it really is the question about what you put together, but I do agree that there will be a lot of 
conservation will be a lot of like more around clinical conditions because uh, you know you don't want to have that bag of tricks when one big bucket and then you somehow uh, get insights out of it you won't get any insights out of it without a clinically relevant question so i think that is a path how it all comes together and that will make a lot of uh, sense it's still quite difficult because just because you have genetic information and you have lab information and you have the radio information right. doesn't mean that you have the insights that's going to be even more difficult right. the more data you have huge amount of data Okay, well, I know we, uh, we're, we're about out of time. So I want to thank uh, Liam, Wim, Thomas, John. You guys were awesome. Um, really good, spirited discussion. Lots of terrific insights. Thank you all so much for, uh, for spending time with us. And I guess that's a wrap. Becky, I'll, I'll send it back to you. Thanks so much, Adam. Um, you know, as, as you said, great discussion, great panel. Um, thank you so much uh, to both you for moderating and to all of the panelists for giving their time and insights today. Um, I know that there were loads of questions that uh, we didn't necessarily get to, so I do encourage uh, everyone to speak to uh, the panelists, um, speak to you know Adam, um, make those connections, set up those meetings. Um, at the very least, you know, drop them a, a, a line on LinkedIn, and obviously we can uh, keep the conversation flowing. So uh, we have one session now uh, left for uh, the evening um, or morning, depending on where you're watching from. Uh, we have our closing keynote presentation uh, from the Chief Digital Officer of Anthem, Digital Knows No Boundaries. Um, that will be at 6 p.m. Uh, in 15 minutes here. So until then, it's goodbye from me um, and I'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you.